just do it. It'll turn out okay. Everyone, welcome to another time, episode of Talking Time with Caffeine, the podcast where we talk about the world around us and whatever we have interest in and, and get some caffeine in our systems. Our, our, our life, our, biolo- our biology friend Jackson is late. So right now we just have Hey, y'all, are just, y'all are just stuck with me, but uh, I got a pretty interesting presentation, I think, to give on the Paleocene, so hopefully uh, your audience won't be too bored before uh, before Jackson gets here and fills their mind with all sorts of taxonomy and the history of the actual life. But until then, what did, what did that life stand on? Yep, exactly. So let me go ahead and share my screen here. Okay. Share, share system audio. Okay. So is the presentation up? It is. Okay. Cool. So today we're going to be talking, or tonight rather, I suppose, uh, we're going to be talking about the geology of the Paleocene epoch. So as with all geologic periods, we got to define what, what are we talking about? And the Paleocene epoch was the geologic epoch, which lasted from about 66 to 56 million years ago. It immediately precedes the KPG, a uh, PG meaning Paleogene, which the Paleocene is the first epoch of. Uh, so it immediately precedes, or um, wow, sorry, that's a, that's a, that's a screw up. It actually immediately follows the, um, the KPG mass extinction, which killed off the non-avian dinosaurs. Therefore, represents the first epoch of the Cenozoic era, and the name for the Paleocene uh, comes from the combination of the Greek word "paleos," meaning old, and the Eocene epoch, which is what follows the Paleocene, and I believe we'll talk about some other time. And so, combining those two words together, Paleocene means the old part of the Eocene. A qu- quick question, though. Yeah. Why did they change it? From- to PG from, it used to be called T, the KT boundary, didn't it? Yeah. Was it just- so funny thing. So recently I was on vacation with a couple, with like Dapper Dino and a few other people. And um, we actually stopped by an older geology museum that still defined it as the KT extinction. And what you'd note if you looked on their stratigraphic chart was you'd have like uh, in the Mesozoic, you'd have the, you know, the uh, Triassic and then the, the Jurassic and the Cretaceous. But then immediately above it, you just had this giant block called tertiary. And that's just, they, instead of drawing finer lines, geologists just said the Cenozoic was this one big block from 66 million years ago to 2 million years ago and didn't want to divide it up any further. Now, that kind of makes sense given how long the periods of the, uh, of the Mesozoic are, but we don't really like things to be that uneven on our charts. So we decided to divide the tertiary into uh what we could now call the paleogene and then we divided that into three segments to to be about even with with, at least a little more even with the others and so because we changed the name we had to change it from kt to kpg oh we roll fast before i I forget i forgot what this is in the the beginning today instead of talking about a whole 500 million period we are narrowing down our field into a 10 million year epoch yep 10 million year epoch, but one Not- of the most interesting because it follows one of the biggest disasters in Earth history. And so it deserves a little closer attention. And I can't wait to see what Jackson says about how the biology developed. Um, anyways, so what are the boundaries of the Paleocene? Well, as with most, not all, but most geologic periods, you have a well-defined upper and lower boundary. Paleocene isn't really different. Lower boundary, of course, is marked by the KPG extinction event occurred about 66 million years ago. There's a little image I found on the internet there. Big meteor strikes the Yucatan Peninsula. Well, I, I never, that, that was some great photography back then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, I'm jealous of that man's DSLR. Um, and so the upper boundary isn't really a mass extinction, but it's still a very noticeable horizon, um, which we call the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum. And we're going we're gonna to talk about that a little bit later. Again, not really a mass extinction per se, but as instead, you can think of it as a, a big turnover in the fossil record. There's a lot of change, even if a lot of groups aren't dying off, uh, because they have to adjust to the, to the changing climate. 
And that occurred about 56 million years ago. So we're, as you said, looking at about a 10 million year period. here. So we're going to talk for a little bit about Paleocene paleogeography. Just what was the land like at the time? And I'm actually going to skip forward one here. This is what the world looked like about right before, or right, right after, rather, the uh, KPG impact. So this is what you were generally looking at. You had um, a lot. There were these big inland seas still, but you'll notice that unlike with uh, the, the the Mesozoic, you look up in North America, that Western Interior Seaway is getting a lot narrower. It's no longer connecting both. You know, it's no longer splitting the continent in half, and it's starting to get shallow, and that would eventually fully dry up later. Um, you've still got Greenland sor sort of attached to uh, Eurasia. And of course, India is is way out of place, still down there. Oh yeah, Africa still taking it, taking its time getting up to Asia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Australia is still connected to Antarctica, which would eventually. Uh, it, look, it looks like the Sierra Desert is the Sierra Sea at this. Yep, moment. at this point, it's pretty much that. Yeah, exactly. So we can go back a bit here. So the Paleocene continued processes, which had actually begun during the Late Cretaceous period. So an example would be the Laramide orogeny, which is, for those who don't know, what built the Rocky Mountains. And that started in the late Cretaceous, and it continued all throughout the Paleocene and actually ended about right before the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum. Uh, this tectonic activity was raising the North American continent, which was causing the Western Interior Seaway to recede as the continent rose up on the land. The continents continued to drift towards their present positions, but the supercontinent Laurasia had not yet separated. Europe and Greenland were still connected. North America and Asia were actually joined by a land bridge. And Greenland and North America were beginning to separate, which you can see reflected here. Yes. So let's look, talk about the climate, because the climate, of course, has a big impact on what sort of rocks are deposited. So the effects of the meteor impact, which, be, which you know, mark the beginning of the Paleocene, and about 66 million years ago, and the climate across the boundary between it and the Lower Cretaceous uh, likely was a fleeting sort of effect. Um, climate resort, reverted pretty back, pretty much back to normal in a relatively short time frame. We're talking maybe a few tens to hundreds of thousands of years. Um, because short, the Earth short, is surprisingly good at real fast. Sh short, short time period in our way of thinking. But very long in creationist time. <laughs> yes, very, very long. Many times older than the Earth is uh, supposedly has been around. Um, but in, in terms of conventional geology, yes, it was a very short time frame. Um, so because the effects of this impact were relatively short-lived, then the early Paleocene, once everything stabilized, generally represented a cooler and drier period than the Cretaceous. Although temperatures would throughout the Paleocene steadily rise and then would suddenly climb very sharply at the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum. Again, we'll get back to that later. The Earth's poles at this time were cool and temperate. Um, for example, North America, Europe, Australia, and Southern South America were all warm and temperate. Uh, equatorial areas had tropical climates, and the north and south of the equatorial areas, climates would begin to get hot and arid. So the climate um, towards the boundary with the Eocene was starting to get warm and humid worldwide, which then marks the characteristic uh, climate of the Eocene, which we'll talk about some other time. And subtropical vegetation began growing in, in Greenland and Patagonia. Crocodiles were, to give you an, an idea of what the world was like towards the end of the, um, the Paleocene in terms of climate, you had crocodiles swimming off Greenland. And you had primates that were evolving in tropical palm forests, which were in northern Wyoming. Not something we'd right now in our world consider to be tropical, but that's what the climate was like at the time. Yeah. Yeah, I think I talked to Erica about that earlier on a, a previous episode. And she said they were those were more primate forms than actual primates. Yeah, well, I'm sure she would kick my teeth in for a lot of things but i'm not a biology guy so okay if, it, if it's got if it if it if it climbs in a tree and it's, it's the closest thing that the primates that we have at the time at the, at the moment <laughs> yeah um so let's take a look real quick at just a, a chart right here of um 
Paleocene stratigraphy. So this is, you can see, that the tertiary was divided up into, you know, we call it the Paleogene now, and then you got your divisions, the Paleocene, the Eocene, and the Oligocene. And then for our Paleocene down here, you know, at the bottom, we've got these individual stages with much more specific time frames. Yeah, and that's what we're going to be talking about. Yeah, like I said before, it's weird. The closer we the closer we get to our time, the more we can actually have stages and epochs divide up instead of fifty million yeah. years to to like a few billion years pre-Cambrian. Now we're getting the closer time periods. Yep more specific yeah, and that's that's very characteristic of geology we like to make things more specific the more recent they get that's just how we are um anyways so geologists divide the paleocene into a stratigraphic set of smaller units which we call stages and these can be defined uh globally or regionally but generally the three main ones the danian uh Selandian, and thanetian are globally defined and they are in fact defined by the uh, the ics which is uh, an international you know, panel of geologists and earth scientists who get to decide where things are drawn. So let's look at the Danian, for example, Danian, Danian, whatever it's called. Um, this was first defined in 1847 by a German Swiss geologist, uh, Pierre Jean, I'm God, I'm going to butcher this, uh, Eduard Dessor. And it was based on the Danish chalks at Svens, Clint, and Foxe somewhere over in wherever that is. <laughs> um, yeah. And it spans from about 66 to 61.6 million years ago. And it was initially defined, fun fact, as an upper like extension of the Cretaceous, but this was somewhat quickly changed um, with, with the more recognized extinction event that was uh, found in the rock record. And the disparity in the fossil life between them. So the upper boundary, which connects it to the overlying stage, is uh, coincides with the top zone of a couple of foraminiferan species, who I know Jackson would probably be able to pronounce these, but God knows I can. In other words, but for those in the audience, little tiny microscopic microfossils are what define the top of this stage. We just see a change in the foraminifera that are in the in the rocks and it's it's pretty a pretty sharp divide and we just draw that as our line and overall it was a very calm and pretty normal cool and temperate uh, period of earth history that shows that life had fairly quickly recovered from the kpg extinction overlying the danian is the slandian and this is was is actually defined um at itzerun beach in the bath town of zumea just as the overlying uh, Thanetian is. And the Selandian uh, spans from 61.6 to 59.2 million years ago. This was also proposed by a Danish geologist, uh, Alfred Rosenkrantz, in 1924, based on a section of fossil-rich marls overlain by gray clays that he noted in uh, the Danian chalks and limestones that he studied. And there was an unconformity between them, which is that unconformity is what he, you know, was what he uh, noticed and was where he started drawing his divide, although it would later be revised a little bit. Um, the start of this uh, stage is thought to represent a sharp depositional change in the northern sea basin where this area is defined. Um, because you see a very sharp divide between silicoclastic depositional sediments above and underlying calcium carbonates. And this, this change in deposition where you have, in, you have like sands and muds and other things instead of carbonates being brought in rather suddenly is thought to represent the uplift and erosion of the Scotland Shetland area after a, about 40 million year uh, period of calcium carbonate deposition. Which of course means that it's calcium carbonate deposition that extended well into the, into the Mesozoic. Um, Fun fact, this change in, in sedimentation pattern occurs at about the same time as the onset of a foreland, uh, foreland basin formation in Spitsburg uh, due to the compression between Greenland and Svalbard, suggesting there was probably a common tectonic cause which altered the relative motions of the Greenland plate and the Eurasian plate. And this plate reorganization event is also manifested um, 
further out in the Labrador Sea by a noticeable change in seafloor strata that you can see the traces of in the rocks. So it looks like around this time that this, the divide between this and the underlying pure, um, stage rather had occurred just as a more simple, simple term, seafloor spreading changed directions. This caused a change in the motions of the Greenland and Eurasian plate, which also caused uplift and erosion of the Scotland area. And suddenly, because the water got so much shallower, stopped deposition of carbonate muds and began to bring in like sands and silts and other, other clastic rocks uh, that are rich in silica from up in the mountains that were then being eroded. And immediately overlying this is the Thanedi. And this, just like the underlying uh, stage, are defined at Itzrun Beach. And the reason they're both defined here at this one regional area instead of globally is because this is one of the only places where you have a continuous record of rock that makes the boundary easy to see. In most other places, it's missing. And so well, either one is eroded or one's too too buried or is too altered and folded. And so it's difficult to define these two stages on a global scale. Um, the Thanetian lit, uh, lasted again from 59.2 all the way up to 56 million years ago, right where we have the Eocene. And this, uh, this stage was first proposed by Swiss geologist Eugene Renevere in 1873 begins a little bit after what is known as the mid-Paleocene biotic event, which seems to just be a short-lived climatic event globally that you can see around sediments of this time, um, which is recorded at its run by a dark one meter interval um, of sediment caused by a reduction in calcium carbonate. And this short-lived climatic event that happened globally, rather than just the local one we talked about earlier, is thought to just be caused by an increase in global methane. From what I could tell, no one's really sure what caused that increase, but in any case, it didn't last terribly long. And then this stage ends with the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum, which is a really interesting event in Earth history. Yeah, I've heard about that. Isn't that, that's mm -hmm. when they got a lot warmer? Yep. That was when you had relatively quickly a five to eight degree Celsius global average temperature rise. Uh, the exact uh, age and duration of the event is uncertain, but is estimated to have occurred about 55.5, 56 million years ago. And it is marked geologically by, and this is what I meant by it's not a mass extinction, but it's a very recognizable boundary in the rocks, irregardless of that, is there is a prominent negative drop in the stable isotope ratio of 13 carbon and 12 carbon, which, as you can see by this little symbol here, we call that a delta 13 carbon reading. And <clears throat> it seems that this decrease was primarily in um, this decrease of the, the 13 carbon, 12 carbon ratio was primarily in marine and terrestrial carbonates and also organic carbons that we have, such as coals from the time. And stratigraphic sections of this rock show numerous other changes. Uh, so for example, you see the fossil records of many animals, even though there's not really extinctions per se, they have major turnovers, uh, particularly with microfossils, which I'll talk about in the next bit. Um, yeah, you, you would think uh, with the getting warmer, some animals really fast, some animals might die from it. But Yeah, because they... you, you have to remember at this time, the world was still kind of, was like it wasn't having massive aftershocks of the, uh, the, of the KPG extinction, but there were still a lot of niches to be filled. So it was a little easier, as far as I understand it, for animals to diversify during these changes and, and spread into currently untapped you know, resources okay. rather than just going extinct, like what happens when you have a meteor strike the planet. Um, so yeah, so you have major turnovers and changes in the fossil records without seeing giant die-offs of groups and also sediment deposition at many outcrops. And you can also see this in many drill cores changes significantly because when you have changes in global temperature, that affects what kind of sediments are being deposited in oceans and floodplains and other things. Um, and so you might switch from having a, 
in an area with braided rivers, for example, which leave a very characteristic sort of cross-bedded river deposit. If it warms up and it becomes more suitable for plants in the area, then that's going the plant roots are going to slow the river and you might end up having meandering deposits like on you know, the Mississippi. So that's, that's one example of the sort of changes you could see. And here's an, here's an interesting little chart that I found of uh, this is this is an oxygen 18 curve. So this 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 represents the ratio of oxygen uh, 18 and oxygen 16 and you know shows the you know the uh, the polar ocean temperature at the time is what these numbers here uh, represent. But even if you know you're dealing with somewhere else, the pattern globally is about the same. And right here, you have your period all throughout the Paleocene, right about here, and then it goes all the way over to this big spike that happens rather suddenly, and then almost immediately drops off afterwards. That was the thing that you know caught geologists' interest when they're like, "Why did we have this massive spike?" Because if you look at this entire curve, you know, drops in temperature like this, you know, at which you know, as you can see here, correspond to you know glaciations in the later Oligocene are not really that surprising, but having a massive just spike like this in temperature rise and then have it drop off immediately is very strange. Yeah. yeah. I'm not positive. I heard this was like the uh, warmest the Earth has been. Well, pr probably since we were still a molten ball of rock. <laughs> More like the Carboniferous, but yeah, it's it was it's the warmest the Earth had been in a very very long time. So, what caused it? Well, it's thought to have been caused by a short period of intense warming and ocean acidification brought by the release of a lot of carbon into the atmosphere and oceans. And this warming is an example of the sort of fossil turnover you see, led to the extinction of about 30 to 50% of benthic foraminifera, those microfossils again, because those things are, um, are very sensitive to changes in their environment. And so they're out, you know, you, we even do this today. You can look at the like diversity of these foraminifera, these little microorganisms in the water, and you can use it to gauge the health of the marine ecosystem. And this is the only real extinction we see, but the fact that almost 50% of them just drop off indicates that the oceans were significantly affected. Um, and that the, thing, the earth wasn't doing terribly hot, even if it wasn't really a global mass extinction per se. Um, and the onset of all this dumping of carbon and ocean acidification is um, is linked to volcanism and uplift associated with what's known as the North Atlantic Igneous Province, which is this big um, volcanic uh, uh, section of rock up in the North Atlantic that would have, of course, because you're having underwater eruptions and things like that, dump a lot of carbon into the ocean, which would have changed the Earth's carbon cycle. And also because you know, it can come out through the ocean and into the atmosphere through sprays and things like that would also have affected the atmosphere. And as a result, you have this big igneous province form, this massive amount of, of, of igneous rock and volcanic activity on the seafloor. You're going to cause very sharp changes in Earth's carbon cycle and consequently the temperature rise we see. But so, however, despite this link. Real fast. So how close are we now to that carbon cycle in present day? <laughs> are we, are we getting Where, that or still far? Uh, not, not at that. At that temperature but we're approaching that that sort of a significant change it's not at the same exact number in terms of global temperature of course because this wasn't a glacial interglacial period like we're in now earth temperatures are cooler than they usually are right now but the sort of change that's occurring in the world right now as a result of climate change is actually pretty comparable even if the actual temperature isn't and that's that's not good that's really bad. And that's why, you know, for one of my for one of my courses that I'm taking right now, I had to do a big essay on uh, why I'm so staunchly against offshore drilling and not just for the help of, you know, us here in Florida. Because I I'm so against the oil industry. It's not even funny. Anyways, um, regarding this, this link to this volcanism, the, you know, yes, there's a link, but we're not really sure if this was the actual cause or maybe just like a compounding factor to the change. 
And in fact, the specific cause, the, the, the specific details of like what was the exact time frame of this thing in terms of like how many thousands of years, tens of thousands of years did it last? And the overall significance of the event on life, even though we do see the changes in the extinction of the, the foraminifera and stuff and the changes in macroorganisms, the, the degree to which it affected the ecosystem and all that is still pretty uncertain. So that's uh, that's that's the basic geology of the Paleocene. Is um is Jackson here by chance? I didn't see. He is. No, I'm not here. Oh. Hi, Jackson. Yeah, I, I was about to write you saying how long you how how long, how long what's your timetable because Jack Colton's almost done. But as soon as I was writing that message, you appeared. Well, I okay. I appeared right in the uh, nick of time, as they say. Like a wild Pokemon. Fantastic. I, I suppose. How are you doing, um, Jackson? Good. I'm all right. I, I it was a, it was a long day at work. Let me no, tell I'd you. I'd imagine with them fishies, and then they have like a, a party afterwards. And it's, it's a lot. <clears throat> the fish had a party. Yes, the fish are partying. The people are partying. Everyone's but not partying. the employees. <laughs> well, I think some of them. Uh, went to the party. Uh, Speaking of parties, um, I was invited to one tonight. So if it's okay with Vandalia, and I'm sorry, Jackson, but uh, no, I it's not okay to, with me. Actually, I, I, I do have to dip here. But I do I not believe you. This presentation. I cannot believe this. I am shook right now, Colton. I'll come back and watch it. It's but, okay. No, I don't care if you watch it. You're supposed to be. Oh, fine. Go to your party. <laughs> have have fun with your friends. I will, and you know, have fun with Jackson's presentation. I hope mine was interesting, even though Jackson was late and didn't get to see most of it. I saw a part of it. I was there. You saw the last slide, I'm sure. You were there, like the, like like his rocks were there. Yeah, good book, by the way. Okay, I'm gonna get out of here. Thanks for having me. Um, hey, real, real, fast, real, real fast before you go. Uh, how are you at the end of November, guys? Well, at the end of November for our next segment. Yeah, I'm fine with that. If you That's want to fine. do one on like the Eocene, if we're just going in order at this well, point. At this point, it's random. I, I, okay. was thinking, I was thinking either the Permian or the Jurassic. Which, which Ooh, one? let's do the Permian. I want to talk about the Permian mass extinction and the big volcanic deposits that are there. All right, I'll set that up for the end of November then. Sounds good to me. All right, take care, Bye. guys. Okay, laters. Later. Welcome. Ah, welcome. Hello. <laughs> I'm here now. Cool. Uh, As I uh, said at the beginning of this, instead of instead of going through a 50 million year period this time, we are narrowing our focus down to only 10 million years. Indeed. But a lot happened those 10 million years, did it? Did it not? <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, let me share my... what I call the return of the synapses. <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, they'd been there the whole time. They were just uh, in the shadows uh, <laughs> under, the <laughs> under the feet of the dinosaurs, um, staying out of the way. There have been some there have been some uh, interesting hypotheses about the role that um, mammals played in the extinction of the dinosaurs. There were some uh, hypotheses like dinosaur uh, mammals ate the dinosaurs eggs oh yeah i, I remember that in the 80s you know that, yeah that sort of stuff and uh dinosaurs had like diseases and you know, that wiped them all out and etc but um but no none of that really explains the uh the rapid uh disappearance of dinosaurs and it doesn't really fit with the geological record which indicates uh a the uh extinction of the dinosaurs via meteor so the cretaceous ended 65 million years ago oh yeah i, 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 meant, to, I meant to ask about that for the longest time they were saying 65 million years ago but not recently they're, they're talking they're saying 66 million years ago i 65 66 um yeah. i it's look we're, we're talking about yeah, I, it's I was, somewhere in this million year range. Yeah, I was wondering. I was wondering about that before. It's like, like, did they did, did they get better dating equipment, or or sometime in the nineties and two thousands that year that million year mark had passed? Well, what well, what really happens is they say 
it's like 65 million plus or minus okay. however many hundred or ten thousand whatever it is and i guess yeah they got better deposits to date and as a result because remember you have to date igneous deposits and so they got they found better deposits that they could date and this ever so slightly pushed the date back so why just, didn't the animals there just put on their calendar so we, so we can know that would have been helpful so uh all right so the paleocene can we see the slide we can okay so the paleocene lasted from about uh, 66 to 56 million years ago as vandalia said just a slice of 10 million years so it was during this time period that the mammals uh refilled the ecological barrel in a sense to to borrow from from stephen jay gould and niles eldridge because the dinosaurs got wiped out they got wiped out by a meteor as well as a lot of of uh, other um uh amniotes the other diapsids like pterosaurs and like mosasaurs and plesiosaurs all these guys got wiped out and so all these uh, niches were available for the taking and as colton already explained the period ended with the paleocene eocene thermal maximum which raised the earth's temperature um, so here, uh, this picture on the uh, on the right, that is a map of Earth. I, I bet Colton probably showed something similar. Um, as you can see, it looks pretty much like today. Not a whole lot of difference. The but uh, a little bit closer continent and and India is still free free willing in the middle of the ocean. Right. Exactly. Yep. India is still way out in the uh, the um, uh, what is it called the the Panthalassic Sea or something like that. I can't, uh, can't remember what the name of that. Yeah, I think it starts with a P. I think like, I think it's the Panthalassic is the name of it. But anyway, and you can um, see you can see that North, South America, Antarctica, and Australia are still close together too. Yeah. For the what, that, that, that the marsupial path they took. Uh, right. Yep. Yeah, the marsupials basically uh, their common ancestor uh, was in South America, and so the. Interestingly, the most basally derived uh, marsupial a lot, marsupials alive today are the um, the didelphids, which are the the possums and their relatives in North America, because they independently or they radiated back into North America from South America. But most marsupials uh, either stayed in South America and they went across Antarctica and ended up in Australia, which is where we find uh, most of them today. And we have found now fossils of marsupials in Antarctica dating to the Eocene and the Paleocene. So that uh, there was a whole lot of debate among paleontologists as to whether marsupials went through Africa on their way to Australia. But it turns out not to be the case. So that was an evolutionary prediction, as nice. you might say. It, it, is it hard to get fossils out, out from Antarctica? or is it? I guess it depends on where you look. Um, there are coastal areas which have exposed or which which are exposed but i feel like it'd be more difficult more inland um i did actually meet a paleontologist who dug in antarctica her name was Ooh. dr julia clark um she was the one who named a uh, vague avis which is this kind of goose-like bird from the cretaceous interesting little guy um the other major thing is like europe is still largely um archipelagos yeah, As we it saw was the, in the light Cretaceous. Yeah, Colton had a better picture of that that was a little, little bit more closer to it. So, and okay, I, good. And I see we have some giant snakes over there. Yeah, so down there on the left, you have Titanoboa, uh, which was a, a giant snake. So even though the dinosaurs got wiped out, there were still lots of really large reptiles around, and reptiles do very well in high temperatures. So the, the warm Paleocene and the warm Eocene uh, allowed for these guys like Titanoboa and you see a turtle kind of in on the right side of that picture. That's Carbonimes, which was about the size of a car, like a smart car. And so, yeah, there were still some very large reptiles around, even though the dinosaurs, the, the non-avian dinosaurs were no longer around. Of course, the birds are still around. And so they made it they made it through the extinction. Um, predominantly, it appears um, like birds that would have eaten uh, seeds and nuts survived, and they would have probably been burrowers. So that's an interesting uh, little tidbit. 
of course, mammals were still small. They had been small for a while. The largest ones are about the size of a badger. But then, uh, but then they radiated. And so here's a, a picture from a paper uh, uh, published in 2019, untangling the multiple ecological radiations of early mammals. And so this pick this uh, very nice little chart here. Um, so as you can see, the uh, the groups which are around today are the monotremes, the marsupials, and the placentals. Uh, but they were not the only ones to make it through the KT extinction. The multituberculates are an early uh, crown mammal group. They made it through. Um, they made a, a ways into the Cenozoic, but eventually went extinct and same for the, the dryolestoids. Um, the multituberculates are a group. They're named for their teeth. They have multiple uh, tubercules on their teeth, or first like the, the cusps, and uh, a number of them survive. Or you can find them on both sides of the KT uh, boundary. Like if you go to Romania, um, there are several uh, different species on like the, the Hateg Island, the dwarf dinosaur island, and so a lot of those multi tuberculates survived across the boundary. So, question, is that dotted line there the uh, KPG boundary? Yes. Yeah, that dotted line right there. Yeah. Um, of course, monotremes uh, survived. Marsupials survived. And they radiated later. They had their radiation in, or you see a sort of radiation of them in both South America and Australia. And then, of course, of course, placentals. Placentals had a really big radiation. They... Um, filled up uh, most of the niches in like uh, South America, North America, Africa, Eurasia. So not have, so, so you're saying not, not having to carry your baby in a pocket kind of helped radiate better? I don't know if that specifically was the reason because I mean, you know, marsupials did fine where they were. They radiated immensely. There were, there were lots of carnivorous marsupials in the fossil record like Thylacoleo and Boreana. And these other guys, and so I mean, they they did pretty well where they were, and even when they had to compete with um, with placentals like the noto ungulates, they still did pretty well. So okay, so marsupials they they did okay for themselves. Um, all right, so next slide. So here we have a tree of placentalia. All the placental mammals is from a 2013 paper. Um, so the outgroup there is Monodelphus, the, uh, uh, possum. And then, uh, that the next little group you see up there, you see Loxodonta africana and, uh, Dezipus. So Dezipus is the armadillo, Loxodonta africana is the elephant. So those two are, represent, uh, Atlanto genata, which are the Afrothares. So elephants, manatees, uh, golden moles, elephant shrews, all those guys, all the, these guys who radiated within Africa. And then Xenarthra is our sister group. So that's the anteaters, sloths, and armadillos. And they uh, evolved within South America as far as it seems. And then a few of them radiated northwards once the Isthmus of Panama closed. But then the other big group uh, is the Boreo Eutheria. And that's uh, most placental mammals are in this clade. That includes... so. Uh, this is again broken into two more groups. And then the two groups are the Uarchontogliers, which are the rodents, uh, lagomorphs, which are the rabbits, tree shrews, and the primates. So you see uh, Homo sapiens, Pantroglodytes, they're all up there. Um, Mus musculus, so that's mice. Uh, then you have rabbits and the Okatona, that's also known as the Pika. The, 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 lagomor the lagomorphs. Uh huh, right, the lagomorphs. The rabbits and their kin. Um, and then the other group, that's Laurasia theria. And so that first group you see up there with Erinaceus and Sorex, that's Eulipatifla. So uh, Erinaceus is the hedgehog, Sorex are shrews. So Eulipatifla is like shrews, hedgehogs, uh, moles, desmonds, all those guys. It used to go by the by the name Insectivora, but that has since become a wastebasket uh, taxon and was um, discarded. When uh, molecular data came in, because they included a bunch of members or, or a bunch of mammals in this group that were not in that were not closely related 
for instance, elephant shrews are not closely related to shrews. Elephant shrews are more closely related to elephants, who would have thunk it? Um, or the tree shrews. Tree shrews are actually more closely related to primates, it seems, for right now, than they are to um, shrews and those other guys. Then, of course, Chiroptera. Those are the bats. Um, and they're an interesting little group. Uh, did a video about them a while back, so if you want to know about their evolution, go check that out. I uh, did it with Tony Reed, actually. So I've um, heard of him. Yeah, he's a cool guy. He actually just put out a video, I think, yesterday. I have not seen it yet, but I need to. So yeah, sorry, right. Tony, if you're watching. <laughs> um, the Carnivorans. Uh, Felis Catus, that's your domestic cat. Canis Familiaris, your domestic dog. Of course, um, uh, within the, the, the cat group, the cat kind, <laughs> your uh, Feliformes, you also have meerkats, kivets, uh, binturongs, hyenas, all those guys. Of course, your lions, tigers. Oh my! And then within the dog, uh, carnivorans, the caniformes. You have your, uh, you know, wolves, foxes, as well as bears, seals, uh, weasels, raccoons, all those guys. And then finally, you have the ungulates. So Perissodactyla. That it says a uh, equus cabalus down there. So that's your, um, your, your. Um, uh, your normal horse, your domestic horse. Uh, but of course, Persidactyl also contains tapers and rhinos. And there are also other horses alive today, like the, the Przewalski's horse and Kayangs and all those guys. Um, the, then Set Artiodactyla. So that's all the even hoof mammals. And it says Vicuña, which is a relative of the llama, uh, Boss, which is the cow. And then uh, I can't see the bottom one oh yeah terciops the, dolphin. the dolphin shaped thing yeah the bottom is dolphin Sorry, now it's at, at this time were all the animals still like like say shrew size shaped almost yeah yeah pretty much actually so yeah that's my next slide um all right so here's a little sampling of a couple different uh paleocene uh mammals so yeah um, everybody's like a shrew and they're first starting to branch into larger forms. So Purgatorius up here in this top left is an actually an early relative of primates. They call it a primatomorph. I just put early primate. That's fine. Um, so Purgatorius looks kind of like a shrew, but it has a couple features that unite it with primates. Um, it really doesn't look like one all that much on the outside. But that's kind of what you expect. We are so far back in primate history, primate evolution, that they don't quite look like primates yet. Um, up there in the top right is Osapaya, which is actually which is a very interesting animal because this this little guy is an early Afrothere. So Osapaya seems to be the ancestor of the group that includes elephants, hyraxes, manatees, aardvarks, elephant shrews, um, tenrecs. All those guys came from something like this. So this is a transitional form, which is sort of uh, ancestral to the whole of Afrotheria. So that's a very interesting transitional fossil. Um, Barry Lambda down there on the bottom left is a pantodont. So pantodonts are uh, members of this, are large members of this group called uh, Simolesta. And I think right now it's not really known quite where they fit, other than that they are eutherians. So they're, they're placental mammals, but where exactly among the placental mammals, I think is still being debated right now, but some yeah. of them got fairly large, and so they're herbiv herbivorous. Um, so that was sort of a first attempt at a large herbivore in the Paleocene. And then you also have your large carnivores, like Sinonyx, which is an early Mesonychid. Mesonychids are kind of an interesting group because they were thought to be ancestral to whales originally, but that turns out to not be the case. Uh, they're not ancestral to whales. They are very, they're still very close to, to whales. You basically have like whipomorpha, which are the hippos and the whales and their sister to each other. And then outside of that, you have like the mesonychids. So they're, they're a very interesting little group. Um, carnivorous ungulates. If you can imagine like a, uh, you know, like a, a deer going carnivorous. I guess, but that's not really a good analogy because we don't have anything alive today like these guys. I mean, look at the size of those teeth. So. So, so you're saying that Santa feeds the 
elves to the deer. <laughs> it, it could be the case. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, so Mesonychus is an early ungulate. Um, and that kind of got me thinking about other early ungulates. So one of the most basally derived ungulates that researchers are aware of is that guy up in the top right, Criacus, who lived from the Paleocene to the Eocene. So Criacus is pretty much only identified or, or united, sorry, with the um, with the uh, the ungulates based on a couple of features. One of them is the shape of the inner ear. It has a unique the unique ungulate inner ear, which is very interesting. And so, um, so this guy really doesn't look like an ungulate. You know, there are no hooves. It looks like a like a, a cacomissile or some sort of raccoon, but so, it's not. So at, at this point, were they all still five five, five finger toed things? Or are they? Yes. Yeah, yeah. We're not even dealing with hooves yet. So this is how far back in ungulate evolution we are. Um, uh, Ectoconus, that down there on the uh, bottom right, as uh, as a member of. Uh, uh, Paraptychidae, so also in the Paleocene, so another probable early ungulate, but again, doesn't really look like an ungulate, does it? It looks uh, more like some sort of um, like a carnivoran of some sort, which isn't super surprising because sister to the um, to the, the ungulates, as we saw previously, was in fact the carnivorans. So it's not really surprising that their common ancestor was some sort of weaselly looking uh, animal. But in the case of ungulates, it became herbivorous. While in the case of, of carnivores, they became carnivorous. And then some of course became herbivorous later, like the red panda or sorry, like, like the panda. Actually, I think the red panda is the red panda also herbivorous. Maybe. I don't know. Anyway, um, Hyopsidus and uh, Phenacodus also early perissodactyls. So um, I just wanted to give sort of this as a when you think of an of an ungulate, you think of a deer or a cow or a giraffe. These guys don't look like any of those. They look very different. Um, I mean, clearly, you know, look at that skeleton. But these guys have features in common like that that uh, diagnostic inner ear structure, which make them ungulates or they have teeth like ungulates. And that's how. We connect them. And so, you know, uh, it, it just, this, it makes a lot of sense to me that the early ungulates don't look a whole lot like ungulates. That took a bit of time. Well, and, we have, we still have, well, we still have a few million years to get the, get, get a speciation going. Yeah. It's not really until you get to the, um, the Eocene when we start seeing sort of more similar. Uh, ungulates but then in a lot of cases even then that's not necessarily true it's not really until later that things start looking more normal because <laughs> this is just the the early part of the radiation and then uh, then of course i uh, ended mine with the same chart that colton showed so um so oh so any questions so no no terror birds or giant snakes or anything like that in your slides. Well, we did talk about giant snakes. We talked about Titanoboa. Oh, that's true. Um, but terror birds are an interesting group. Um, I don't remember where they shake out, but there has been some debate about their ecology in recent years because it was thought that for a long time that they were these big uh, carnivores because they had this huge, absolutely massive skull. It's huge. Like if you compare it to an ostrich skull. Ostrich skulls are very small. They get this huge like Gastornis skull. And the thinking was, oh, well, this is being used to kill, you know, small uh, small herbivores like little paleothayers, the ancestors of horses or other small ungulates. Um, and I think I've seen, I saw something not too long ago that said, well, maybe actually the, the large beaks were used for snapping branches. I don't know if that's the case. Why not both? You know, who's to say they weren't omnivores, right? Species so. like one branch decided to eat eat the meat, other branch decided to eat the, like like 
eat eat the seeds and fruit like like birds today do. Exactly. Yeah, and oh, we know. Yeah, we know birds of, of diff, different groups who some eat meat, some eat you know, fruits and nuts and all that sort of stuff. Um, the early the earliest elephants also really don't look like elephants. Really, uh, the whale ancestors don't really look like whales. Um, it's just mammals are just starting to sort of branch out and figure out what's available, what's in the environment. You know, what can we do now evolutionarily to sort of anthropomorphize them and within just 10 15 million years they really started to get into a lot of niches yeah yeah i, I always called terror birds the holdout the dinosaurs they, they couldn't take they, they just couldn't accept the fact their time was over with and like no we're, no, we're still on top people i, I mean in some places because you, you find like gastornis in europe and there is a forest forest rachis or however you pronounce it in south america until like the Pliocene, so in some place they really did hold out for a very long time. They held out for quite a while. It would have been horrifying to see one of those birds. Uh, we have some questions here. Okay, one question. What this question is from? Uh, can, you, can, you see, can you see the screen? Was climate change part of the extinction as well? For who? The dinosaurs because there was there was um an event in addition to the uh meteoric strike which was uh the the deccan traps um and so you have the deccan traps and they're putting out uh lots of greenhouse gases and toxic fumes and things and um and so these are yes are warming the atmosphere and so they, they probably did contribute but the final nail in the coffin for the dinosaurs was was the the asteroid impact? Or maybe talking about the uh, yeah, Colton mentioned this. There was no really a big extinction, any extinction at all during the the thermal maximum, but mm. it probably affected some animals. I'm guessing, right? Yeah, it probably did because that's what climate change does. It causes uh, lineages to adapt or go extinct. Um, so yeah, as of right now, I don't think there are any like good candidates for this thing. Definitely got whacked by the the PETM. Um, I wouldn't be surprised though, to find out that, that, you know, a couple lineages did get whacked. That really wouldn't surprise me. Although it was already a fairly, it was already a warm and tropical world. Right. And it had been for several million years. And it was until like the end of the Eocene, still a very warm tropical world. And then you have these glaciation events leading into the start of the Oligocene, which caused temperature to drop temperatures to drop. All right, so we still, we have also have a, a few uh, things from Brain Bug. Okay. Right. Yeah, that, exactly. That's yeah, that's what I was saying. Yeah, diapsids are they are st yeah they yeah you had forest rachis in uh, in South America until the Pliocene, and you had Gastornis in Europe. Yeah. All right. So they said, yeah. right. Really takes off among mammals here, South American. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of like early uh, Xenarthrans. Um, but yeah, you're right. Um, as they were refilling the ecological niche, because you have to remember, they were insectivorous dinosaurs too, like the Alvarezsaurs with their weird little one claw on each arm. Um, so there were, uh, there were insectivorous dinosaurs. And so it's really no surprise that, you know, uh, right after the dinosaurs go extinct, mammals would come in because I'm sure that there were most mammals were insectivores already. So mm -hmm. how hard would it be to evolve just to be a larger insectivore? You know. Uh, I, next one from him is some clades of Daisy. Uh, well, Daisy Iridae. So to evolve towards insectivore, that includes the ancestors of the. Is that a new word for you? <laughs> uh, no, I confused myself as to which one that was. I was thinking of a different one. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, there's a year a day. Uh, I misspelled it. But uh, yes, yeah, insectivory. Yeah, insectivory has re-evolved in a lot of different... Um, mammals because a lot of mammals are small 
Yeah, uh, yeah, Numbat, Tasmanian, uh, Devil, the Quoll. Yeah, those are all yeah, uh, Daisy Aeromorphs. And Sectioria is that's that's another way of that's still a carnivore, right? Meat eater, but, but yes, but this yep. is but this is a little bit more specific kind of a meat eater. Right, yeah. Um, I mean, because you have like pangolins. Pangolins were actually um, were confused as being members of Xenarthra for a long time, based on uh, and so researchers put the pangolins with this in this group called the Edentates, uh, based on morphological similarities, which were actually convergences. So it turned out aardvarks and pangolins did not nest with anteater sloths and armadillos, because. When even though they're all the toothless ones, that's what he did Tata means. Because when molecular genetics came along, it turned out pangolins nest with the carnivorans, their sister to the carnivorans, and aardvarks are actually aphrothairs. Yeah, and so speaking of, of aardvarks and aphrothairs, that's the next comment he's talking about. Among aphrothairs, the Paleocene is the period where the aardvarks appeared. Yeah, um, there's also an interesting. Uh, an interesting little case of an aardvark in Madagascar. This guy called Plesi oryctoropus. And uh, researchers really couldn't figure out where it, what sort of mammal it was until they did paleogenomic studies on it. And then it turned out to, to be an afro there. So I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, Madagascar has a lot of weird critters. That little, I that little island breaking off to have a little well, it's thing. a big island. I also... Mezzanikids rule. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, we did talk about those, how they were thought to be. Um, it was thought like Andrew Sarkis um, and uh, Mezzanikids were the like sort of ancestors of whales, and that was held for a long time. Um, but then once, once um, uh, we got more fossils of whale ancestors, like Pacacetus and Ambulacetus, and then we got the genetic data from hippos, it turned out that the idea of, of mesonychids being ancestral to whales kind of fell out of favor, but they're still fairly close. Yeah, like they're still up there, but just not directly ancestral. Yeah, I, I think I, I, I forget what, what year it was, but they found some animals that had that their ear was almost like a, a whale ear, almost. Yeah, whales have a, a distinct uh, bone in the ear um, called the involucrum. And so that, and they use it to hear underwater. And the earliest, uh, the earliest whale relatives like Pacacetus and Ambulacetus, they also yeah. have that involucrum, and so that's how they're able to be identified in part, as well as teeth. They have uh, dental similarities with, uh, and and cranial similarities with, uh, like the basilosaurids. And so that's one of the, that's a part of the reason why. Sorry to panda creationists here, but when you argue with creationists about whale features, they really have no argument. Because as soon as you get into the nitty gritty of comparing Basilosaurus and Ambulocetus and Pacacetus, suddenly their arguments about morphology fall apart because they all have like this whole suite of characteristics. Uh, speaking of Pacacetus, uh, I think I pronounced it wrong. But was was the was the end of the Paleocene when they started appearing, or was that a little bit yes. later in the Eocene? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the very, I believe it's like the very. End of the Paleocene, the very start of the Eocene is when you see the first cetaceans like Pacacetus and Indohyus appear in the fossil record. And then because whales, because you get like Basilosaurus and Dorodon evolving by the end of the Eocene. So within about a 10 million time span, 10 million years, like 12 million years, something like that, you have the whales appearing. You have, you go from a uh, semi aquatic uh, ambush predator to big marine predator that don't need to ambush anything but this is it's big enough that this hey i'm here your food now yeah and that, that was only about yeah 10 million years or so it's, it was a pretty rapid transition but that's not surprising it's not surprising it was rapid because you have a very very different physical dynamic going on in the oceans than you do on land so there would have been some pretty strong selective pressure to be better at swimming uh, if you're hunting fish out in the ocean and also create um, also a rock yeah, creodonts. Uh, I believe those were one of the. Were those also uh, carnivorous um, ungulates? Brain bug. Can you refresh my memory on that one? I think they were, but I'm not positive. 
uh, while, while we wait for that answer, he also said, talking about your D Yes, that's true. I have, um, there's a video and it was horrifying the first time I saw it, but it's a, there's a little chick walking through the grass and a cow kind of like eating grass right behind it and just mows over the chick. Just eats it. And yeah. yes, hippos will eat carrion. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, pigs are already thinking, but I, I remember when I was when I was going to church still, my, my teacher was talking about a farm like a, was a farmer one time he said he had a, a chick get caught in the pig pen bleeding and the pigs devoured that chicken. Oh yeah, pigs, yeah, pigs will eat anything. Um they're they're omnivores basically. So yeah, they'll eat meat, roots, all that sort of stuff. Um there's an there's a hypothesis that they're that they may be eating meat for calcium for their antlers. Um, I don't know how well supported that is, but that's one explanation I've heard. But I forget I forget where this was in your, in your slide. But you're talking about this. What's the what slide that was? We were talking about their pupils like pigs. Gotta wonder what their pupils. What their I, I, pupils it was, it was at nine forty seven on your the thing, so I don't know what, what you're talking about at the time. I, I don't know I, what their pupils look like. I don't know. You got me on that one. Yeah. I guess Plus, the, these I, are these are all, I mean, reconstructions. So, yeah. you know, I don't know. Right. Gastornis was in Western Europe. Yeah. Yep. All right. And finally, he said. Weren't around just yet. I was talking about in the uh, the Pliocene. I believe they were in the Pliocene, weren't they? In South America. But also, I'm curious, actually. I'm going to look up the creodonts because I cannot seem to remember if the internet will let me. Uh, creodonts. They were, drum roll, uh, blah, 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 blah. carnivorous mammals, okay, so that live from the Paleocene to the Miocene. But were they ungulates? I think they were early ungulates. They extinct, possibly fi uh, polyphyletic. No, this is ferrae. So possibly related to carnivorans and pangolins. That's, yeah. what, you, that's what you said right there. Or nested with oh, carnivorans. we just said that? Nested with carnivore and pangolins. Okay. Oh, well, good. There you go. Okay. So, right. yeah. Possibly right. polyphyletic. Cool. Eight. So, brain bug, Eddie, ogre, you have any, you have any questions you want, to talk, you want to ask Jackson here about the life of the Paleocene? Yep, the uh, there there were um, lots of birds, lots of birds. They they did okay getting through. Uh, most of the or a lot of the um, uh, superordinal relationships among mammals had already happened by the end of the Cretaceous, and that was a that was kind of a shock to um, paleontologists because it turns out that like you know primates had already separated from like the rodents before the the KPG extinction, and you know the ans the uh, ancestors of Afrotheres had already separated from the ancestors of Xenarthrans. A lot of these relationships had already started splitting before the Cretaceous happened, and then they took off. And um, a lot of terabytes are long gone before humans are. On. Yes. Yeah, I think that was a question from the chat. Because I can put somebody in the chat. I said in the Pliocene, humans weren't in the the Western world until <laughs> like just a few, like ten thousand years ago or so. The Pliocene was like two million years ago. Or five million years ago, something like that. Speaking of terror birds, are, uh, are they true birds or more basal? No, yeah, they're um, the. I believe only the the paleognates and the neognates made it through the KPG extinction, like the Confucius ornithines, the Enantiornithines, all those guys. They got wiped out before the. Uh, in Cretaceous extinction, I believe, or right at the in Cretaceous, they didn't make it through. Uh, so it's only like the ancestors of, although the Paleognates are a weird group because it was thought that they were flightless 
while Pangea was still congealed. And that's how they ended up on their respective islands. The Austrias in in Africa, the Rias in South America. Um, oh, with Eddie about terror birds. Oh, I don't know. You got me. I'm not a bird person. Um, and also like the emus and cassowaries in Australia. However, it turns out, funny enough, um, that the Pelignates independently became flightless. They actually flew. The, the, the clade split after Pangea split, meaning they all flew to their separate continents. The ancestors of Rias to South America, the ancestors of ostriches to Africa and emus and cassowaries to Australia. They all flew there and then independently became flightless in all of those different places, which is mind blowing. But it kind of makes sense if their ancestors were not very good at flying already. Um, and, and, the best flyers of the Pelignates today are the Rias, which suck at flying. So if they all already were bad at flying, then it wouldn't have been that big of a stretch to just say they lost it once they arrived. But there are also some birds on the other side that also lost their flight, like penguins Manignates. and dodos. Yeah, yeah. Dodos are, are uh, pigeon relatives who lost their flight. I don't know where penguins fit. Um, I don't, I don't know where they fit, um, in all honesty. So, um, I don't know if they're like water birds that lost flight capabilities or what. I guess we can look it up. Why not? Let's see. Penguins. No. Give me the answer. They are. No. Not penguin publishing. Um, Abe's family order. No, 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 no. Uh, none of those. I'm trying to figure out the answer Wait, here. Looking at Brain Bucks is bringing back a PSD memory. It says, it said we both talked the smoky saying about rat tights. Yeah, very briefly. Um, hold on one sec. Uh, acor ornits. What is this? Are they water birds? Um. They are water birds. Hey, I think I said that. Yeah, they're they're part of the um. Yeah, they're part of the group that contains like storks, cormorants, pelicans, loons. Oh, they're the the passerines, passeria. Wait, are they? Whoa, weird. Okay, Telerave, oh. passeria. Um, but yeah, you're right. We did talk to um. Smokey, he brought it up among other among numerous other things. Um and sort of forms. Yeah, you're right, they can, they can do that too. Um that's the for anyone who that's like the uh, maybe we got as that's as the ducks and their relatives. Yeah, may, well, maybe you got ideas for a future video once you're done with your ancestor tales. Actually, we do have an ancestor's tale about the ratites. We will there is one about um is it the ostrich's tail? I think there's one about uh, about the um, the the f independent flightlessness of the ratites. Um, but, but yeah, but that's way down the line a little bit since we're still in the homo homo area area of the thing. I haven't well, the ch chimps fortunately, yet. <laughs> um, this the next video is the last hominin. Uh, it's going to be uh, Artie's tail, so Artipithecus, the last hominin. Then we get. We finally move on to our next. Oh, well, oh fi well, finally, we're out. Of, finally, we're gonna be out of the homo, homo genius. <laughs> yeah, after like eight episodes, because I think Artie's tale is episode eight. So yeah, eight episodes later, we're finally out of the hominins and into Pan. And then there's two. There's two for the chimps. There's a bonobo's tail and a chimp's tail. So yeah, we we got a long ways to go. Um, what was I saying about um the birds? Oh yeah, it's Smokey. That's right. So that debate with Smokey, if you guys haven't seen it, uh, my, my debate with Smokey, um, it was a it was an interesting debate because he's like intelligent design, but he basically said, yeah, OK, to every point that I made. So. Uh, we, we He mentioned uh, that like octopus or aliens at one point, so that was interesting. Um, oh, yeah. Was, like. 
Oh yeah, uh, David and I, I was with David and AJ talking talking about. We talked about uh, that's what Matt Powell thinks too. Yeah, think. it was a really stupid. Um, it was like an actual paper that some researchers, like a gr a group of researchers, got published. I don't know where. I don't know where it got published. It was not in any reputable journal. wasn't in Nature. wasn't in Science or PNAS or any of those. It was in some other journal, and they claimed that octopus have like alien genes that are in no other organisms. Cephalopod researchers don't know where they go. All this bonkers stuff. And it's just been a meme, really. I it, like nobody has taken it seriously except creationists. It's hilarious. I know, as I said, like, so they're aliens, but they have they share the same DNA as us. Does that make us aliens too? <laughs> right. Yeah. It's like there there are no genes they have that are just out of nowhere, just magic poof alien genes, and that and like because the, there were cephalopod researchers who were like, what? Because we have, um, we have like genomic data for uh, like Nautilus, as I think, and and a couple other uh, mollusks. So uh, you, you uh, oh, you're saying you're oh, that reminds me. And in, in the slideshow, you mostly picked some land. You mostly start circled land animals and a few, probably a few birds. But what was life in the ocean like this time? I, I know the the. The ichthyosaurs, the mosasaurs, and the long neck plesiosaurs were, were going extinct here. What the rest of the life on the ocean? Fish. Um, I don't know when. Sea, oh, I think sea turtles were already around because the earliest sea turtles we have are from the late Cretaceous in North America, interestingly. So we had sea turtles. Um, fish made it through. Uh, sharks, of course, made it through. They did fine. Um, they've always <laughs> they make it through every extinction. Uh, they made it through the freaking Permian mass extinction. Um, and really, the sharks were the dominant predators in the ocean again for the first time since like the. Uh, yeah, since like the, the Permian, they were the, for the first time since the Permian for like 200 uh, million years, they were back on top. You know, um, and then it wasn't until a few million years later when you have the first whales and you have Basilosaurus and um, all these other big predatory whales. But then the sharks came back again with the with the megalo, megalo, Megalosaurus or Megalodon. Megalodon. Yeah, well, that wasn't until. Well, it went extinct two million years ago. I don't actually know when it first appeared. But yeah, Megalodon was a large, uh, large shark. A carnivorous shark, not like a not not a planktivore like the whale shark and the basking shark, but yeah, actually a carnivorous shark, and uh, and that's why we didn't have baleen. We didn't have large baleen whales until megalodon went extinct, and then once it went extinct, we got large baleen whales. But yeah, sharks made a brief comeback and still went extinct, and you know here we are again today. The, if you want to make it as a large shark, you have to be a, a planktivore, basically. So, uh, oh yeah, like whale sharks are they whales or sharks? They're sharks. Okay. Yeah, they're they're large um, carpet sharks. So basically, you have like the zebra shark, and um, and the the members of that group. Uh, that's. Um, Stegostoma, I believe, is that is that genus for the the zebra shark. So whale sharks are basically really scaled up zebra sharks. So, oh, what, zebra. do they look like zebras, or are they just someone well, named it that? Well, zebra sharks are named for the stripes that they have when they're juveniles. They have black and white stripes, but actually, when they're adults, they have spots like a cheetah. So, which is very interesting. And whale sharks also have the spotted pattern. Um, and, but they do have to return to the seafloor to give birth, like uh, like other carpet sharks, which is kind of cool, I think. So you can't escape your ancestry. Sorry, you know. Yeah. Oh, he says. 
Yeah, yeah, Mega Tooth. I think. Are they also planktivores? Do you know Brain Bug, the Mega Mouth? Because I don't actually know for them. Yeah, I don't know if they're planktivores. Sh shark are sharks more of a family in order? Uh... Um, I believe they're in they're in order. I think um, Salaki. They are the or at least a clade. Um, because you have the chondricti, if chondrictes, which is the total group, and then you have um, uh, uh, the not holustii. That's the other one. It's the other group. Uh, you have Salaki, which are the sharks, Batoidia, which are the rays, and then holo something, holo something, which is the um, what are they called? The chimeras, you know, the or the ratfish. Those weird guys, those weird cartilaginous fish. They actually have one at the um, at the the Atlanta Aquarium. I'm drawing a blank. I gotta look it up. Uh, what are they called? The Chimera. We're all learning stuff today, even Jackson. I learn stuff every day. I'm always learning stuff. Um, what group? Holocephaly. That's what it is. Goodness gracious! I was drawing a blank. Um, oh yeah. So those are all cartilaginous fish. Yep, that split off from from our bony ancestors. Yeah, that was way back in like the Ordovician when that occurred, because you get the split between rayfin and lopefin fish in the Salarian, um, and then of course the transition from lopefin fish to tetrapods in the Devonian, about the mid early yeah, mid Devonian. Yeah, that, that, as far as we got back so far, we, we, we've only gotten back to, to the Devonian. We haven't got any further back than that yet, but we'll get there eventually. Yeah, we could do it. Yeah, Cambrian. It's in the Mac. Well, yeah, yeah, I get that, but I'm saying, like, what does it eat? Is it does it eat fish or does it eat plankton? I mean, I know that the whale shark can eat like small fish, but I mean, like, does it eat big fish like the like great whites or does it eat smaller fish like like a uh, whale sharks? Because I don't know the answer to that. Um. Uh... I'm curious. Let's find out. Let's see. What does it say? Uh, it is a filter feeder. Okay, so just like the the whale shark and the basking shark, it's a filter feeder. Okay, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. So yeah. yeah so all three of the largest sharks, they're all planktivores. They're all so, these filter feeders. So, but plankton, that's still a carnivore, right? If if another filter. Yeah, I mean, you're eating an animal. Yeah. Uh, well, is zooplankton? So. There are different types of plankton. There's zooplankton, which are like small animals like copepods, which are little shrimp. And little phytoplankton. Crystal. Yeah, and then there's phytoplankton, which as Colton mentioned, like forams, diatoms, radiolarians. These are all protists, which are um, doing photosynthesis because they have a, a an endosymbiotic relationship with a red algae. So, yeah. I so, like we have any more questions here. And, and, so... Well, overall, what's your opinion about the pile, the pale scene? It's pretty neat. Um, it's interesting that some of the the mammals which were prominent during the Cretaceous survived the KPG extinction, made it into the Paleocene, and then went extinct. I find that kind of interesting. It's like they did okay, and they kept doing okay until the placental mammals came along and sort of pushed them out of whatever niche they were in, like maybe rodents or something like that. We're just so what, better at that job. So what mammals were these? I, I know they're not, they're, they're, they're very tuberculates. Yeah. So that, they... that's one of the early uh, groups of crown mammals. So you have like the monotremes, like your, your uh, platypus and echidna. And then you have then slightly more derived than that. You have your multi tuberculates, uh, which I mentioned uh, in that little chart. Um, okay. they're named for the cusps for having multiple cusps on their teeth and, uh, they're insectivores predominantly. So were, were these like still egg laying or they, the life, life birth side yes. of the thing? I believe they were, I believe they were still egg laying. I believe, um, because we well, have to remember, um, the, a lot of, I believe much of the development for like, for platypuses. It's not a lot of development that's actually in the eggs, I don't think. I think it's it's like only a little bit that's actually occurring in the eggs. And then they latch on to mama and they stay there. 
Um, and so I think it would have been the same for the multi-tuberculate. So a little bit of the development in the egg and then mo much of it outside. Yeah, if, I remember from, I think it was Aaron's video talking about how even the marsupials are still a like, tiny birth giving thing. They're yeah, still... we, um, yeah, we truncated the amount of development that you do in the, um, in the amniotic sac, uh, the amniotic egg. And so as a result, our babies come out or their babies come out super underdeveloped. And so there's a lot of time that you have to spend developing. And that, and so you're um, in danger of getting like eaten by a predator, which is why you have to latch on to mama. Um, a lot of placental mammals have solved that. So they have very precocious young. Uh, we are not uh, precocious when we're young. We are also born underdeveloped because we have such a big head. So we have to be born underdeveloped so we can squeeze through the birth canal. And then once we're out, then our, our brain balloons. Yeah, I so. saw a video about that. on I think it was uh, PBS Eon or something like that. Or, or I think you're, you're smart or something. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if, if they made a video about it. But yeah, yeah. giving give he gave a, like a one year old like a like a like a like a math test and ratio test about how to solve a Rubik's cube. He just banged against the, the table. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. Um, but yeah, so we we come out you know underdeveloped, whereas like a giraffe, um, the baby comes out like ready to run. Yeah, um, good thing. Good, uh, good thing. I guess I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing that we can't do that. <laughs> Should we be born? Like, but uh, thanks, thanks for the thanks for the nine months, mom. I'm I'm off to get a job now. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, I mean, we might have different social structures, I guess, or uh, different customs if we developed, um, if we develop sooner, I guess. So. I, well, I, I, so, it, you have any other video plan besides the mini, the ancestral tell mini series? Or are you just focusing on that right now? I'm focusing on that. I sound much better now. Um, I have been sick, not COVID or anything. Uh, I had like a, a sore throat for a while. Um, but I'm finally back to normal. I even sounded a little bit weird in my video because I still recorded while I was, still was a little under the weather. But um, but yeah, I hope to get back into the swing of the ancestors' tale because we still got like fifty videos left, so got a little ways to go. What do you think it'll be? Think it'll be done by 2000, 2023 or or what? Possibly, yeah. I think Aaron's um, series on like uh, phylogeny took like two year, two or three years, didn't it? So yeah. Yeah, probably gonna be a little while. <laughs> of course, he he took he did take a little break there in the middle of it to do his back and forth with Kenty. Yeah, I my channel. I've I've kind of moved away from. I don't debate as much anymore. Not that I have any. If a creationist wants to debate me, I'm fine with that. I won't do it on a on like SFT's channel or something. But. I have no problem doing it either on my channel or on a neutral platform like Modern Day Debate or Dap or someone else's channel. It's fine. Right. I'm fine with doing that. I'm fine with having talks with creationists. Haven't done that. I haven't really done that in a while. Uh, none of them want to talk to me anymore. I can't, I can't figure out why. Um, I, I get tired of losing. <laughs> I guess. Um, I don't really do response videos much anymore. There's one guy. People keep sending me his videos. And um, what is he called? A deflate, I think is his name. Um, he's like an intelligent design guy. And he's basically going over Steve Meyer's Darwin's Doubt arguments, which if you've watched my channel, you know I've already dealt with all those. I've done it in multiple videos. Um, I've even responded directly to a, a Stephen Meyer video where he outlines his argument on that. So, so are you I, saying Chris's don't listen? I'm saying, yeah, they don't have anything. New. There's nothing new in, in creationism land. Big surprise, right? But, um, but I, I, uh, so I'm not, I'm not going to respond to him because he's doing, even though he's doing this series, and I feel like if, if I hadn't done like my, res 20 my other ones to the same topic. Yeah. If I hadn't done the, I think it's, I really do think it's like five or six. It's a whole bunch. It's, it's an oddly large number responding to this guy, responding to, to Stephen Meyer's arguments. And so, like, if I hadn't done those, 
maybe I do this because people keep sending me his video. And I'm just like, I've already responded to all of these. I don't want to, I don't want to do it again. I'll be beating a dead trilobite. So <laughs> all right. well, as for me next week, if it's, if it's internet gets out again, I'm having RJ back on the channel to talk about more Yay. recent, more recent history. Not quite a few million years ago, but a bit more a hundred years ago, probably. Yeah, a little, little bit, a little bit different time difference here. Right, just a little bit. All right. I, I, other than that, as, as Jackson, as Jackson said, he never stops learning. Neither should you. And enjoy the randomness. We'll see y'all. We'll see you next month. We talked about the Permian. Bye.